Okay, we're continuing with reactions of aldehydes and ketones, and the first one is hydration. So hydration just means reaction with water. So we've shown hydration of alkenes to make alcohols. We've shown dehydration of alcohols to make alkenes. Similar conditions to the hydration of alkenes. This reaction is actually not very useful. Um, the product is not that stable, and it's in, the reaction is really in equilibrium. And the starting material, in most cases, is more stable. Um, however, we will use this as a stepping stone to get to the next reaction, which is twice as complex. Hydration can occur through acid-catalyzed mechanisms or base-catalyzed mechanisms. I won't discuss the base-catalyzed one. Um, we'll just look at acid-catalyzed. And so when we have a ketone, in this case acetone, if we're reacting under hydration conditions, we're adding a molecule of water. And so the product is a diol, but it's where both of these um, hydroxy groups or alcohol groups are bonded to the same carbon. And so it's kind of, kind of a unique structure. And so like I said, these can revert back, but we should know the mechanism of how they're formed. It would be helpful for us. So if it's acid catalyzed, we want to use the acid first to get the reaction going. Just like we learned before, water, terrible, terrible nucleophile, needs an acid to get the process started. <clears throat> and so the carbonyl, being partially negative, will be attracted to the acid. And this could be H2SO4, for example. You might see these conditions as H3O+. And so what this does is it activates our carbonyl to attack. And so the carbon was already susceptible to nucleophilic attack. Now it's all the more so because the oxygen really wants that pi bond to break so it can become neutral again. It does not like being positive. And so now even a terrible nucleophile water can come in and attack and form a bond to the carbonyl carbon. As this comes in and forms that bond, the pi bond will dissolve away and those electrons end up on oxygen. And so we have another positive oxygen in any catalyzed mechanism, the first step you use the catalyst, the last step you release the catalyst back into solution. And so that's all that happens to get to the neutral product. Great, take this bond, the two electrons from the oxygen-hydrogen bond will just be solely repossessed by oxygen, allowing H plus to transfer into solution. And a solvent molecule, or another water molecule, is likely to take that and then use it to catalyze other reactions. And so this is an example of a real simple hydration reaction. Again, the product's not all that stable. But you can predict products of reactions, hydration reactions, without a problem. And if we look at these two reactions, we've got ketones, both of them inform, involving cyclic structures. But all you're really doing is redrawing that carbon backbone. And then when there was one oxygen with a double bond, there's now two hydroxy groups with single bonds. There won't be any chirality introduced because it's the same group bonding there. And so it's the same thing over here. If we had a chiral center, at this point, we're not reacting right there, and so that will remain unchanged. No tricks, and we get the hydration product. Where this leads in is to something uh, from earlier in the chapter talking about reactivity of aldehydes and ketones. And so if we look at these aldehydes, well, formaldehyde and 
any aldehyde and then a ketone, and we look at their hydration products, we should be able to predict the equilibrium that exists in, the, in these cases. And so, for example, for the middle one, the, equi the equilibrium actually lies with the hydration product. <clears throat> but just barely. So predict what these other arrows might look like. We can talk percentages. And now recall the reactivity pattern between these three molecules. And so if they're undergoing the same reaction, we should apply that reactivity pattern. And this comes from page 835 in your text. So if it's formaldehyde, it's very, very reactive. And so this is less stable, so it's more likely to form the hydration product. And so if you, all you do is dissolve formaldehyde in water, you're actually dealing with this molecule. And there's enough acid around just in water being amphoteric to catalyze the reaction. And so it's something like 99.9% .9 of your formaldehyde when it's dissolved in water just looks like this, the hydrate. For uh, an aldehyde, it's closer to 50-50. I believe the book quotes 58%. For a ketone, however, the equilibrium lies with the ketone, and this is more like 0.2%. The percentages are not important. This is just an example of how we can apply that reactivity principle. This is a very useful reaction, and we'll see a, a direct application of it um, in the next set of examples. But just like you can react with water, you can also react with alcohols, and the principles are the same. Terrible nucleophiles, we're going to need an acid catalyst. However, the product is going to be different, and the mechanism is twice as long. It's a bit of an intimidating mechanism, um, but you should master it, because the steps are, are critically important, um, and they, they echo mechanistic steps that we've seen before. <clears throat> and so we can start with acetone as our ketone. And now we'll need to react with two equivalents of the simplest alcohol, methanol. And we'll use an H plus catalyst. Didn't really leave room for it. But it's there. And so what this is going to give you, what an acetal functional group is, is very similar to a hydrate, but it's where you have two ethers bonded to the same carbon, just like the hydration product. So this defines an acetal. And in all practical purposes, the R group bonded to the ether oxygen will be the same. It doesn't make sense to ever have them be different. So we can go through this mechanism. Well, we already know the first half. You should be able to, to do the first half of it just like you did the hydration. And I encourage you to give that a try and see if what you're working out uh, with a pencil matches at least my first part. And then you might hit a stopping point, and that's where we can pick up. have an acid catalyst, we use it first, it activates the carbonyl towards nucleophilic attack. That step is the same. When we start drawing the structures small, you know it's going to be bad. When we've activated this, we have a methanol molecule. And so methanol can come in just like water did and attack the carbonyl carbon, breaking that pi bond.
and so we get to this intermediate. And now if we donate that hydrogen back into the solvent, we'll end up with a neutral product. And so if the oxygen-hydrogen bond breaks and those electrons just go to oxygen, we're neutral again, release H plus. And this neutral intermediate actually has a special name. It's called a hemiacetal or a half acetal. Most hemiacetals are not stable. We will see a case where they are stable. A cyclic hemiacetal is actually much more stable. Um, but this is a useful intermediate and a nice comparison to the first mechanism. Well, after this step, in order to get the second methoxy group on there, we need another molecule of methanol to attack. And so, even though the hydrogen just came off, we need it to catalyze the next reaction. And so we know that our alcohol group is going to leave. It's perhaps not apparent that, that oxygen there is not the same as that oxygen there, but we know the alcohol has to become a methyl ether group. Well, if we want this to leave, we have to transform it into a good leaving group. So just like we saw with the reactions of alcohols, you can do that through acid catalysis and protonation. And so when we protonate, we transform it essentially to water, which is a great leaving group. Here, its leaving is actually facilitated by the oxygen coming down and forming a pi bond, and that kicks it off the structure. And so oxygen's electrons will form a pi bond. This will break off as water. And we end up reforming a carbonyl. So this seem, might seem like we're going in, the, in a bad direction. But notice that oxygen is positively charged with the methyl group attached, so it's activated to nucleophilic attack. And so from this point, the second molecule of methanol can come in and attack. And then we just have a protonated version of the final product. So in the last step, again, the electrons flow to oxygen. H plus is released in solution. So in so the first step, we use the catalyst. Then it's released to form the hemiacetal. Then we use the catalyst again. Remember, these H pluses are, are all over the place very fast, protonating, deprotonating, different intermediates. Right, and then we release it again. So it's the same unit of H plus. One thing to be careful when you're going through these mechanisms follow your charges. We have neutral reacting with positive, so this has a positive charge. Reacting with neutral, this has a positive charge. Here we lose H plus. And so since we're getting rid of the positive charge, we have a neutral product. And then reacting with a positive, 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 positive. You only get to neutral by releasing H+. Now these reactions occur with always an excess of alcohol. So you're probably doing them in alcohol as the solvent, and there'll be 100 to 10,000 ton of excess of alcohol molecules. Because water that's released can come in and, and force the thing to go the other way, back towards the ketone, or from the initial product, back towards the hemiacetal. So you want as much alcohol in excess as possible, but they're cheap and easy to do. Normally, if you look at the reaction, it just says two, but it's always gonna be done under excess to get push the equilibrium to the highest yield. All of these steps are really equilibrium steps they can be reversed.
So let's predict some products. You can draw the mechanism for all of these examples. No problem. So try and predict these three, and then I'll put another one over here and we can work through its mechanism as well. Okay, if we look at these, similar to predicting hydration products, the carbon skeleton of this will remain unchanged. And we're going to get two bonds to oxygens, but they'll be sp3 oxygens. The only difference, instead of being hydroxy groups, they're going to be ether groups. And so that ether will be whatever carbon fragment was bonded to the alcohol. So in this case, your product looks like this. And we don't have to worry about nomenclature for alcohol or acetals. Aldehydes react similar fashion, same exact thing. You can redraw the carbon skeleton, two bonds to oxygens, then just following the rest of what was there for the alcohol. This one's interesting, and I encourage you to work through the mechanism here since it's a little bit different, but it's the same exact mechanistic steps. Notice I didn't put a two or excess, but there's two alcohols on the same molecule. And so what you get, just like before, redraw the carbon fragment. You've got two oxygens here. What's tempting to do is that people will draw it like this. But this won't be the most stable product. Um, when you work through the mechanism, you can think about the crucial step. We're actually going to form a cyclic structure, where these two oxygens are the same two oxygens on this starting material. And that's why you only need one. And so they're both bonded together. So it starts to look like people's faces or people wearing hats and such. But this is an extremely stable um, acetal, cyclic acetals. This molecule is called ethylene glycol. And probably the, the alcohol of choice for making acetals. <clears throat> but you should work through that mechanism. Hemiacetals are typically not stable. However, if you can form them from an alcohol and a ketone or aldehyde on the same molecule, they can be stable. And so you should be able to predict this product. Try it. This one is probably easiest to work through the mechanism first. As always, we have to catalyze the carbonyl. alcohols on the same molecule, it's very close in proximity. Remember, these things aren't rigid, but they're floppy like spaghetti, and so it can easily curl around and form a bond, just like an alcohol attacking. And so we want to count our carbons, so we've formed a bond from carbon 1 to 
to the oxygen on carbon four. And so this will be a five-membered ring where one of the members is oxygen. So here's our intermediate product. We can number these carbons again. And these numbers agree with what I drew over there. And then to get to a neutral molecule, we're just losing H+. But because it's cyclic, it has a little more stability to it. And so you should be able to predict these as well and draw their mechanisms. Hemiast tau, because the carbon with the alcohol, there's also an ether carbon or an ether oxygen as a substituent there. Now I want to talk about acetals as protecting groups. And so this is a protecting group that I want you to know, and you'll be responsible for knowing you know, how it's used. Um, I mentioned a protecting group before for alcohols in the, in the previous uh, organometallics chapter that you don't have to know, but that kind of introduces the idea. This one you, you do. Um, so it's very much a, an essential part of this chapter. Essentially, these act as protecting groups for ketones and aldehydes because Grignards do not react with them. And so, if you want to react with a Grignard on part of your molecule, but you don't want it to react with a specific ketone or aldehyde, you can protect it with acetals. Now, in order for protection to work, you need a, a deprotection step. So, you can use the reverse reaction. Acetals can react just with water and an acid catalyst to form either the ketone or aldehyde that it was derived from. And so we have an easy way to go back and forth between acetal and carbonyl. And so where we can apply this is in the following problem. So say we have two molecules and we're planning a synthesis. got a chiral center there, but we don't care about the chirality either. An enantiomer is fine. Um, but it's evident we need to make a carbon-carbon bond. And so thinking about how to put these two pieces together to form this reagent, well, if we're think, putting together carbon-carbon bonds, and it involves carbonyls, Grignards are a logical course or choice or an alkyl lithium. And so you might say, well, I can just take this, react it with magnesium, ether, <clears throat> and then if we take this product and we react it with that, followed up by our water wash, well then we can form bond from our 
with carbon. Make the alkoxide, which then gets protonated. And it should work to give us the product. However, what's the problem? Well, these two groups cannot be on the same molecule. The molecule will eat itself. Or when as you're synthesizing it, it'll react so quickly with other molecules around or the same molecule. Either way, you you won't be able to make this, this won't survive to react with benzaldehyde. So we need to protect this functional group. And so I'll show you how to do that. Or perhaps you have an idea using acetones. If you have an acetal, you can react it with H3O+, and it just, just gives you back the ketone plus your two equivalents of alcohols as byproducts. <clears throat> you can work through this mechanism. It's the same exact mechanism, really, as acetal formation, and it kind of involves, essentially, you're using this to make a hydrate, um, but those hydrates are always in equi equilibrium with the ketone. So I would challenge you to, to solve the mechanism for this. It's very useful in reinforcing the acetal forming mechanism. And there's examples in the book and in the suggested problem. Well, perhaps in the suggested problems or some other problems nearby in the, in the back of the book, but it's very good at reinforcing the, con the concept. <clears throat> and so this will work for any um, acetal even the ones that are cyclic. Wherever you have two bonds to oxygen, that will become your carbonyl carbon, just with acid and water, extremely cheap reagents. So now we can get back to this, and perhaps you know how to plan it out. So that first attempt didn't work. So how can we go about doing this? We're going to have to protect this aldehyde. We want to react with this one, so we protect this other one. And so, for example, if we use our ethylene glycol molecule with acid, we end up with a protected acetal. We can then take this, react with magnesium and ether, to get a Grignard reagent that is stable because it's not sensitive to the acetal functional group. And so then this aldehyde can react. And really, once the Grignard reaction goes, if you just make this an acidic wash, just H3O+, plus, then you'll get to your final product, but we can show the, the initial reaction. And so then we would remove that acetal functional group through deprotection. And so there's a nice section in your book, and these are so complementary with Grignard reactions, it really makes for nice additions to multi-step synthesis problems. When it's clear, you know, you, you can only react with one carbonyl, um, and it combines things from the previous chapter, which is nice.
So now we'll deal with another nucleophile, an amine. Amines are more basic and nucleophilic than alcohols. And so they have a different reactivity. They will introduce nitrogen into the group or into the molecule as an imine functional group. Let's say, I apologize, let's do primary amines. So primary amines specifically named imines. The simplest example involves an acid catalyst, which isn't strictly necessary. Um, it's only necessary to have a source of protons uh, in the solution, but you only need a very mild acid. So sometimes it's written like this. Other times you'll see it just written out mild acid. But you know there's H plus around if you need it for protonation. And so what happens is the nitrogen goes in and attacks the carbonyl carbon. And you end up losing water as your byproduct. But you res your end result is a carbon nitrogen double bond. And this is the definition of an imine functional group, a carbon nitrogen double bond. If you have an organic group there, as long as it's a primary amine, you have two hydrogens to lose. And it's these two hydrogens that can meet up with the oxygen to form water. And so we get a, a different kind of imine as a product. So here's a couple more examples that are a little weird, but the mechanism and predicting the product is still the same. As long as you have two hydrogens on the nitrogen, essentially to predict your product, you're just redrawing your carbonyl without the oxygen, and you're replacing it with nitrogen, and whatever was attached, that was not one of the two hydrogens. And so if you have a, an hydroxy group, that's a common molecule used for imine formation, these have a, their own special name, but that reaction works really well. And even a double amine, this molecule is called hydrazine, but it's the same principle. We redraw the carbon backbone, we're keeping the pi bond intact. Nitrogen will go there, we've lost two of its hydrogens, so whatever else was bonded will be there. And so as long as you have two hydrogens, these reactions will work. <coughs> Let's go ahead and look at the mechanism. For this example, it's a little different than acetals because we have a good enough nucleophile. Remember, these amine nucleophiles are good enough to do SN2 reactions. <laughs> know the products. And so if it's a good enough nucleophile, it can go ahead in and attack. And so it doesn't hesitate, kind of like the, the cyanide or the Grignard reagent, although those are really good nucleophiles. So we reacted something neutral with something neutral. The overall product has charges, but it's overall neutral. We have a protonated amine and an alkoxide. They can just transfer a proton. In truth, 
this would be assisted with the solvent in most cases, and so nitrogen would release hydrogen into the solvent, and then ox the alkoxide would grab that hydrogen from the solvent. But I think it makes more sense for, for simplicity to just show it occurring intramolecularly. And so then you end up with your amino alcohol. And so again, now this is similar to the acetal mechanism because we need this to be a leaving group. So we need to protonate it, and that's why you need the acid there. And so at this step is where the acid comes in. This is a rare circumstance where you have an acid in the reaction conditions, but it's not the first thing you use because it doesn't catalyze the first bond forming step catalyzes essentially the, the second, the leaving group step. And so we make our leaving group. This is a good one to compare to acetals. We have a lone pair, so we can form that pi bond that we actually need in the product. That kicks off the water molecule we get as a byproduct. React something positive with it itself. You have to have something positive. And so the last step, we use the catalyst here. We'll release it in the final part to get to our neutral products. And so again, nitrogen hydrogen bond those electrons just go to nitrogen and so the imine, the imine forming reaction is very complementary to the acetal it's just really knowing the first step and then it should flow very easily so practicing all these mechanisms and mixing them up is really helpful for mastering them <clears throat> okay the last part of this video um, we'll have to do with secondary amines In the reaction with a secondary amine to form an enamine, <clears throat> it's quite similar, and you might go ahead and try and predict the product. And so you can start off initially you know, going like this, but then you're stuck because if you have four bonds to nitrogen, you end up with a positive charge, and that, that can't be your final product. And so what do you do? Well, you can you know, just get rid of one, and then at least it's, it's neutral. You're actually getting kind of close, but let's work through the mechanism and logically think about the steps. <clears throat> First step's the same. We're going to attack the carbonyl carbon. We have a good nucleophile. We 
get the same protonated nitrogen and an alkoxide. And so we can just transfer that hydrogen over. nitrogen hydrogen bond going to nitrogen and so we get an amino alcohol just like before <clears throat> but there's got to be something different that occurs in order to make sense of the reaction. And so we definitely have to get rid of our hydroxy group. And the ultimate product indeed looks like this, but there's an alkene. And so we've given up a hydrogen from the structure, but it just didn't come from the amine. <clears throat> and so here with the catalysis step, we can form our leaving group. And it's at this stage where nitrogen can come down to form that pi bond and kick off the leaving group. Forming this iminium ion intermediate. But then what ends up happening is you release H plus to the solvent, not from nitrogen because it doesn't have any, but from this carbon. And so effectively it could be an amine that takes it or a molecule of water that was just produced. But so if that, the carbon-hydrogen bond falls to form an alkene, the pi bond can break here, giving us the final product. Of course I took it from the wrong side, but it doesn't matter, those carbons are identical. So really it's only this last step that's different between imines and enamines in terms of products. So look at these next ones. Notice you have cyclic secondary amines, but try and predict the product that you observe. The alkene will always form to what was originally the carbonyl carbon. It just can't form, uh, you know, it won't interact with the nitrogen, you know, sp3 nitrogen. product. You can put the double bond on either side. It doesn't matter. In the case of an aldehyde, because that hydrogen is there, it must go in between uh, the only other carbon and the original carbonyl carbon. Um, this particular Amine is just very, very common for making enamines. It has this oxygen there that actually just helps with solubility. But you, it, you're, it's very common to see this, this morpholine molecule and other cyclic amines in enamine synthesis. OK, so the last part of this um, is talking about, well, how can we, we can make enamines and imines. Can you go back to a carbonyl? The answer is yes. We can just call this reverse reactions.
we go the opposite way from an acetal or an enamine or an imine, it's all the same reaction condition. The mechanisms for these are similar. There might be one or two steps that are a little different. But it's just H plus and water that will revert back to whichever carbonyl it was derived from. These would be valuable to go ahead and look at the mechanism um, for any one of these. They're not as valuable as any mechanism up until this point, um, but since they're kind of the reverse of the reaction, if you're looking for more practice problems and you don't just want to keep doing the same mechanism over and over, doing these and looking at them really helps cement your mechanistic understanding so you're not just memorizing steps but thinking about what would go where.